Maybe this is something you've said or thought recently. Election time is always about choosing the lesser of two evils. Some of you have been so disgusted by leaders from the president to the town council that you don't even bother to vote. Or if you do, you still don't believe anything will change or that your vote matters. But the genius of the American system, the way we choose our leaders, is that every two, four, or six years, we can start over and get it right. We never have to settle. That's the I idealism part of the American ideal. Tonight, Jeff Coleman and I will share some ideas about how to pick the best leaders possible with a simple checklist. But it only works if you do your part. This should be a fun conversation. Some of you have known that I had the privilege of working in the White House as an aide to a U.S. president. Our producer, Jeff Coleman, ran for the state legislator at age 25 and won and served. And one of the conversations we have all the time off air is about how we ch could help people choose better leaders, not just curse the darkness, but, but turn on the lights. What would happen if voters, people like you, both Democrats and Republicans, decided they wanted leaders of courage and character, people who put the public's interest above their own? In other words, statesmen. Tonight, something a little different. We're going to share a list of questions you can ask before you go to the polls that will produce better leaders. Jeff, what do you think people get wrong about their choices that end up disappointing them a few months or weeks after the votes are counted? Why aren't we making better decisions? Well, Joe, I think the first um, issue that people have is that they, going into election, become strategists. You know, they listen for polls and they say something like, I don't think that person can be elected, or I could never see that person holding public office. So they've already skipped over looking at people in a serious way. They don't ask the serious questions. They just say, how did this, how will this person play in Iowa? How will they perform in New Hampshire? How will they go up against the person they think will be the eventual nominee? But if you, as you know, if you look back at political history, the story is really more about the persistent quiet candidate often. The surprise happens a lot in American politics. But I'd love for us to go back tonight to some of the older questions uh, that people used to evaluate leaders when there was a chance, we thought, that yeah. somebody would get elected. Yeah. What do, you, what do you say to people who say, you know what, I just don't have time to educate myself about these leaders. You know, I, I, yeah, I know there's TV and there's stuff written yeah. about them, but I don't really have time. Are they shortchanging themselves? They're shortchanging themselves in many, many ways because you're treating a campaign almost like a reality show. There's a candidate for president running right now who um, nobody's ever heard of, and most people have never heard of, but he has, he's treating the campaign as a reality show. So he hired a crew to come in and you can film and you can watch uh, episodes of his show when he spoke here, when he went to this fair and all that. And he's making, he said, look, the American presidency, the way people think about it, um, is essentially a show, so let's make it a show. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, that, that hurts me to my, my core because at the end of the day, the, the presidency is too important a position for somebody to, to just try to get hits on YouTube yeah. you know, uh, for a reality show or wherever it is this show is, is airing just to get hits for it. That's right. You know, uh, it, and using it as just a vehicle you know, to build their own fame, that's not, not right. Uh, in a perfect world, I hope the people that, that um, emerge as our candidates are people of, of character you know, and, yeah. and courage as well. I mean, yeah. people who, you know, I served a U.S. president, and whether people liked him or not or voted for him or not, at the end of the day, I knew that he had character and courage. Right. You know, he'd been battle-tested. He'd been to World War II. He got shot down in a plane in World War II. Right. It survived. Um, but that had to have been a frightening experience uh, for him. Um, and and uh, married his, his, co his college sweetheart and, and, and came back and started a life. He, he, he started a life uh, in Texas. Uh, that was foreign to his family uh, in the oil business, and he was able to to succeed enough so that he could could start giving back because he always but, felt it was important to give back. I mean, so, that's, so think about that. The way that you just described the character of a person wasn't what they said last night or what they how did they perform in the debate. What you just did there is you took a snapshot of the entire life, yeah. and you said based on the evidence of World War II uh, enlisting, serving 
their, their history in business, their relationship to their spouse, how their children, staff uh, reacted to them. Based on this, we have an assessment that says, we believe this person has the character sufficient to be president of the United States. What we're doing now is we're, we're in many cases, erasing everything that happened before today yeah. and essentially asking, hey, you candidate, are you going to fight for what I want today? And if the candidate says, yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that, yeah. and the polls indicate that there's sufficient support, that's the person we're going to support. And I think that's all backwards. So yeah. that's why we have a list today. Well, I, I, want, to, I want to get to the list. So the, first, the first one is, um, what is the durability of core personal and professional relationships, especially marriage, children, and key staffers? You kind of answered that, I suppose. That's right. So if you're looking at a candidate, the first thing I think you have to look at are core relationships. Who You look at the picture of the king and the queen, right? And you say, well, who is the person next to him, the queen? And then you look at the children, their relationships. Then you begin to form a picture. Same thing with the candidate for president or senate or town council, is you want to say, who are the people that f currently are in the ear? When that candidate goes home at night, who is the person that helps them form a decision? And does that person respect them? Do they listen to each other? Is there a collaborative relationship? What about their kids? Have their kids who had this upfront, close relationship with that person? Not just are they doing well financially, but did the kids have a conversation? Are they kind to each other? That should tell you almost everything you need to know. For a political figure, you have to add one more category, staffers. You and I have yeah. met many people yeah. who've had phones thrown at them, who've had uh, all the temper tantrums of a political leader. If they're not treating their chief of staff, their secretary, their scheduler with kindness and dignity and respect, they're not going to treat the country well. Yeah, that's right. That, that one thing that I admired about President George H.W. Bush was how he treated people when there were no cameras around. Right. Uh, he was genuinely interested and kind to people, uh, including the people that cleaned his office. So, you know, and he was kind to me. And, and so I, I just really appreciated that, that he was thoughtful toward the people yeah. who were in his staff. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's a great point, Jeff. Well, l let me ask uh, question two. What's the reliability of a candidate's values and worldview tested by time and the experience outside of, uh, outside of politics? So where do your ideas come from? Um, as, you, as you know, in politics now, the first thing that a candidate typically does is commission a poll. Yeah. And the poll isn't supposed to be a roadmap to tell them what they believe, but it often is. Because you hear someone speaking and you say, I see your lips moving, but this doesn't appear to be connected to anything that we know about you in the past. So is it important where a, person's, uh, where a person finds their values? Where do they go to school? Do they go to church or not? It's not a disqualifier whether or not they go to church or not, but where you go can sometimes we knew from President Obama or we knew from President Bush or Teddy Roosevelt or George Washington that the, or Abraham Lincoln. The person that they listen to on Sunday morning is often the person that is helping inform them. President Trump talked about being influenced by Norman Vincent Peale. Yeah. You know, that was his spiritual mentor. So that helps you at least understand where somebody is coming from, not just in a religious sense or a faith sense, but how do you get your idea of what right and wrong is? Yeah, yeah. That's so important. Uh, Jimmy Carter, I, I know that you visited yeah. Plains, Georgia recently. Yeah. You know, and, and is it true that Jimmy Carter still teaches a, or until recently he was teaching a yeah, Bible study? Yeah, up or? until recently he was teaching a Sunday school class. And uh, he took, you know, the Bible and uh, same scripture, same words, and he didn't always line up in the same spot that, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention did. He was a Baptist. Uh, but he had the views, as many presidents do, about the dignity of the individual. Now, a guy can get up, or a woman can get up at the, the beginning of the speech, say, I respect individuals regardless of who they are. That's why we shouldn't have prejudice and discrimination and we shouldn't hate people. Great. Now, the next step is, if you're putting a checklist together, is, so where do you get that idea from? And if they can't say, well, it's because I believe that people are made in the image of God, so they deserve respect, or I believe that comes from the Western idea of, of uh, how we treat human beings, that human beings have dignity. 
If you can't trace that idea back to a source, you really don't have a basis for, for your belief system. Yeah, boy, that, that, that's, a, that's powerful. Um, uh, I don't know that most of us, um, or most people who vote, uh, especially when they're voting for candidates on a statewide uh, basis, like right. for governor you know, or U.S. Senate, um, or even for a mayor of their city, you know, look that deeply. I think most people are swayed by campaign slogans. They're, right. they're swayed by, you know, as you said, candidates will do will commission polls to see like what people think and sure. what resonates with with the folks that are going to be voting for them. And then they basically feed that back to them. That's right. And, and and whoever has the most compelling way of feeding that back is the one that usually does really well and maybe even ends up winning. Um, but 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 all these things that you're talking about, you know, are, are it really entails voters going a little bit deeper than the campaign slogan or the catchy uh, commercial on television. You've got to you've got to almost put your respectfully put your finger in the chest yeah. of somebody and say at the county fair uh, when when a candidate is glad handing at the market, put the finger in the chest. Say, listen, I heard what you said. I'd love to know more about why you believe what you believe. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think that uh, the inability of a politician who has a great platform to do good retail politics uh, is, is a, you know, shows a, demonstrates a weakness? Like somebody who's great on the stage, they can give a good speech because the speech is written for them and they're reading the words. Right. Good readers. But, but, right. but, but then when you meet them in person, they're looking past you or they, they don't, they don't. Tell me what you think. Sure. I think you can have a person who has a great resume who has a good family, has a good worldview, but if you can't articulate that vision, if you can't make it come alive, it's almost like a bad history teacher. Yeah. It's like someone who says, okay, today we're gonna study 1787, but not tell you, give you the sights, the sounds, the, the global events, the things that made 1787 a consequential period in history. So nobody wants to be in that history class. Right. You're putting them to sleep. Right. I guess it makes you wonder too, like if somebody's not good at the retail politics, you know, like, like they're looking past you or they're not engaging with the individuals yeah. that are in a room, um, maybe that says that they don't genuinely care about people. I, I, I don't know, maybe, because I would think that if you, if you genuinely cared about me, I'm a voter, I'm one of thousands, maybe millions of voters, but if you genuinely care about me, you, you might want to look me in the eye and talk to me, engage with me Agreed. like a human being, you know, ask me what I think or say it was nice to meet me, yeah. you know, as opposed to just... Well, so that comes, uh, the next one, uh, we says, what kind of life experience beyond what they're saying and, uh, will, will they need to have in, in the office? So, you know, if a candidate often, you know, comes up from poverty, that life experience is going to form the way that they treat people who are poor, or they have to acquire that experience. You know, we famously, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, when he was running for yeah. president, you know, he didn't really have a heart for people who were poor. And then he visits the Delta. Yeah. And then he visits places like Jackson, Mississippi, and he comes back to the dinner table. Yeah, tells his kids. With stories, tells his kids. Right. That these are the people, when you grow up, you're going to fight for. And you go, okay, that makes sense to me now. Um, doesn't mean, you mentioned George H.W. Bush, who came from privilege. The parents balanced off that whole notion of privilege with this idea of responsibility to whom much is given, much is required. So your life experience, the, the candidates uh, that we're, we're picking, the leaders that we're picking, we have to look at their life experience and say, look, based on what we think is going to happen in the next few years, we're going to need people with maybe some military experience. We're going to need people with, with uh, experience in the financial markets. Looking at their resume, not just what they say their positions are on the issues, extraordinarily important because you never know what a candidate's, the, as you know, right. the, the crisis that candidates will face as leaders. Right, right. Well, we have a lot of people who certainly aspire to these uh, high offices, but not everybody who aspires is the person that... Uh, is ideal to lead, and uh, uh, because leading is uh, is a challenge, um, you know a little bit about that because you ran for office uh, and won a seat in the state house. Uh, but then once you won that seat, I'm sure it was a little bit different um, than than just the campaign. <laughs> so apply this this idea of experience to my life. Yeah, you know when I was 25, I thought um, that youth and energy would compensate for everything I didn't have in terms of life experience. So for example, I campaigned on the idea of eliminating school property taxes, but I didn't own a home yet. 
I owned a home after I was elected. It was the first time I was actually paying taxes and a mortgage. So I was speaking of something and people were like, yes, we agree with you. But I didn't fully understand those issues. I didn't fully understand what it meant to, to sign the back of a paycheck versus the front of a paycheck. You know, what did it mean to own a business? I own a business today. So that has something informs the way that I would today look at those issues. So ex life experience, how you treat people, how you want to be treated, what your record is in small business or right. as you know, big business is really important. Yeah. How yeah. you got to where you got. Yeah, yeah. L let me ask uh, uh, question number four. Um, do they have the temperament and judgment to lead, to lead in and through the inevitable crisis? We know that, uh, you know, sadly, if you watch the news like we all do, uh, yeah. you know, there's just one crisis after the other. Um, you know, we're just, and, and then there are the bigger issues that are, that are you know, re reaching crisis proportions, which would be the economy right. and, and housing uh, and, and, and immigration. You know, these are all important issues, let alone what's happening around the world. Right. I mean, because if you're president of the United States, you don't get just to focus on the, on the domestic issues. You have to deal with what's happening around the world. You're, you're necessarily drawn in. You have to talk. You have to figure out what is our posture going to be with regards to China? What's our posture going to be with regards to Russia? You know, uh, the Middle East, Israel, all those things matter. Uh, our posture. And, in the and world. you have to see the role of the president of the United States or any other uh, position in terms of who they have to interact with. So, for example, the American approach works in America. Mm. But if you do not know how to subordinate your passions, if you don't know how to turn some diplomacy on, personal kindness or charm, uh, the, the aspects of diplomacy that are needed when you are uh, negotiating a treaty with a world leader, all of those things have to do with your core temperament. Yeah. Now, this kind of goes back to question one. What are your relationships like with your spouse, your children, your core staff? You know, and some people say, well, I just, I like people who are just gonna throw down and throw a punch every now and then. Yeah. Be we like them being unpredictable. Yeah. Is that the way we should look at it? Or should we look at saying, look, over time, if we put all the candidates on the table, say who has the judgment to restrain their passions? You know, for those of us who are Christians, there's a whole lot in books like Proverbs about how to rule over your temper is a wise uh, leader. Yeah. So, you know, this is something that we've almost discarded in our, our recent uh, political life, but I think we have to reconsider it. Yeah, it's very hard. If you're a Christian person, Jimmy Carter, somebody who is a Christian person and, yeah. and, and openly professed faith in Christ, had to make a decision in the late 1970s with regards to uh, our posture toward Iran. Right. And, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, he allowed the collapse uh, of the Shah's regime, and that led to the incoming of the Ayatollah. Yeah. And, and so we know what that has meant in terms of U.S. relations with Iran over the last uh, few decades. But so was that the right decision? Did he have the right temperament? Um, somebody else would have said, you know what, maybe the Shah's not a nice man, but at the end of the day, he's just what we need in, in Iran yeah. to protect our U.S. interests. So this is what you're doing. You're balancing your core principles, which is your worldview, with a pragmatic view of how the world works. And once you have weighed that, you come out with an answer. Now, the leader sometimes has an overriding sense of what their core principles and values are. So they sound like moralists. They sound like ethicists. They're dealing in theory. And then you have other leaders who are on the practical side so consumed by getting it done that it doesn't feel like they have ever asked the question about is this right or wrong? Yeah. So as, as voters, you know, we're on the board of directors for a country, you get a chance to look deeply and say, okay, how much pragmatism versus how much principle do I want? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've just given you four questions, ways to test and evaluate the candidates seeking your support for public office. When we come back, three more. I think it'll be worth your while. Don't go away. You're watching Joe Watkins' State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. Jeff Coleman and I both enjoyed early careers in public service, but today we want to help you, our viewer, come up with a few questions to ask that might help elect better leaders. 
No matter what party or where you fall on the issues, we hope this will encourage you to be a good steward of the system the founders left us. Jeff, we've given them four questions. What's the next one? Well, do they have the maturity and sincerity uh, to understand what the position of people who are on the other side who hold a belief that's different from theirs? Meaning, when they look at an opponent, do they just see someone to defeat, or will they take enough time to say, I know why they hold that position? Many, many politicians hold positions that are different than ours because of their life experience, because they have a disability, or they have a, a, a cousin, or a spouse who has been involved in a particular issue, and they care more deeply about something. If, if you look at them and say, they're, no, they're a political enemy that I'm going to roll over and defeat, and you don't take the time to learn what motivates them, like someone like an LBJ, you know, who's the master of the Senate, certainly a master tactician in, uh, when he assumed the presidency and delivered that big, great society you know, agenda, but you look at him and you say, he was actually a student of people. He knew temperamentally how far somebody would go and he wouldn't ask somebody to go farther than he thought they could go. And he used heavy handed tactics, he used all kinds of things that I wouldn't recommend that people do. But the point is that you have to be willing to study and learn from and listen to people who hold different views than you. Yeah, does the system that we have uh, reward you for that? I mean, so you're an elected official, are you, are you rewarded you know, for, for caring about what the other side thinks? I, I'll say you are rewarded for authenticity in relationships. Whether you work in a state capitol or you work in Washington, most people are phony. Most people have an agenda and most people want something from you. But if you can just go and build sincere, real relationships, like the president you, you served for, who, who, who remembered birthdays and was able to to understand that there's life outside of serving me and working for me, um, I think you go much farther. You may not win every election, but you're going to go much farther than you ever expected to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He that, that president ended up becoming friends with the man who defeated him. Yeah, that's which is right. really pretty amazing. That's right. Close friends. Here, question six: Does the leader have humility and good sense to tame the tongue and bridle the keyboard? Now, sometimes not taming the tongue can help you. I mean, sure. you know, there have been times when you know, I mean, Ronald Reagan was uh, in, involved in a debate, and, uh, and, and, and I, I think uh, his opponent invited some other people to join the stage, and he said something to the effect of, you know, I paid for this microphone That's right. or whatever. Yeah, and, he, he, and, he, and he showed his anger, and, and, uh, and, 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 and that worked for him. There's a strategy and timing, right? You don't want a candidate to constantly be broadcasting, or a leader, what they're thinking all the time, right? We have national secrets. We have a system of checks and balances. We have negotiations that are always ongoing. You're dealing with Congress. You're dealing with a world power. So having the ability to say, I'm not going to say everything that I think all the time is important for the security of the country, but also uh, I think is there's just a certain level of decency not to turn every moment into a reality program. Right. So, so you look at um, the, the exchange early on in the, in the Trump administration between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-il, and initially it looked like it was headed toward disaster. Yeah. And, and it ended up being brilliant from the standpoint yeah. of, 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 of actually creating stability in that part of the world. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, between uh, the United States and, and North Korea. There's different uh, moments, I think, when you talk about soft power or hard, raw power and knowing, and the leader knowing that we're willing to use all of the resources and assets that are available to us to settle a dispute. President uh, George W. Bush certainly uh, made good on his threats many times. President Reagan did. There's a, a time for strength and there's a time to, to demonstrate a certain kind of humility in our posture. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, seven. Will they have the personality and professional reputation that attracts top tier professionals uh, to their administration? And that's very important, we know, because it's not just the president it's the, or, or the senator or the governor, it's the people around them that they, that they bring in to work with them. Yeah, we're out of time, we'll leave it there. That, but you know, if you want to get something done, you have to have people to do it. And a government where you have millions of workers, there has to be an esprit de corps, a sense of mission that attracts people to government. If you can't attract anybody to an administration and build top tier talent, yeah. I think it's almost impossible 
to enact the agenda. So you look at presidency and you say, why did that presidency fail? Why did that leader not get anything done? When they were so gifted and they had so many natural abilities and they had charisma and all that, or why didn't their legacy last past the four or six or two years of their administration? Why did it just go away? P part of that is because they didn't attract quality people. You know, one of the, the benefits we had, I think, after World War II was you had this flood of people who had been in combat, who went back to finish their degrees, built businesses, built stable families, contributed to their church and community. And they said, oh, by the way, 20 years into it, I think I'm going to run for the legislature. I'm going to run for Congress or run for president. So you had people who had, were temperamentally prepared for these big responsibilities who weren't ruffled in the same way that someone, some of us today who, who didn't wear the uniform might be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like what you were talking about, you know, that generation that was battle, literally battle tested, right. you know, so that they had the temperament uh, to, 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 to lead. Right. They, they had seen the horror of war, uh, they had survived it, and they had gone back to their homes, they had gotten degrees and yeah. built businesses and the like. And then for them, this was all about service. You know, how do we serve the country? How do we prevent what happened in the Second World War from happening again? How do we keep a, have a safe world and a prosperous that's country? Right. And, and that's kind of, I think we're, I mean, nobody wants World War. Everybody would like a prosperous society. I mean, how do we get there? Well, selecting leaders who are the right leaders at the right moment requires us to put aside being a pollster or a strategist or an analyst just for a few minutes, leading up to a primary, for example, and saying, all right, in the ideal world, who is the kind of leader we want to elect? And guess what? Polls actually change when people evaluate candidates that way. But if we just evaluate on standards of electability or how much money they can raise, we'll end up picking people I think in the end will be disappointed with and their character will be lacking. Yeah. Well, there's no right checklist for choosing a leader. We all have different ways of taking the measure of the man or woman seeking public office. But in our system, you and I have the incredible privilege of being in on the choice. Pray for discernment, pray for courage, pray for those who serve. Friend, before you turn off your TV tonight, visit our website at joewatkins.org and post a line or two about this program. And while you're there, click on our YouTube channel and watch and share tonight's program and other past episodes. For America's First Capital Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins, along with Jeff Coleman and our great team at Lighthouse TV. Thanks for welcoming us into your home tonight. God willing, I'll see you next week. That gives everybody a lot to think about, which is, which is good. And I hope people just take time to think before they vote. Stop looking and listen. <laughs> yeah, stop looking. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.